Good morning. Thank you, Ann. I'm Randy Sullivan of Patton Sullivan Brodell, Program Chair for the Real Estate Section. Uh, today we've got our 1031 exchange program that we were originally going to do in mid-March before the shelters in place kicked in. Uh, James Kaleas is our speaker this morning. He's a Vice President and Certified Exchange Specialist at IPX. He's a Berkeley alum, worked in finance for Merrill Lynch. Uh, he's been working exclusively in 1031s for the last two decades. He works and assists investors and attorneys through the process. He's ready today to cover what I think are the most pertinent topics for us uh, right now, um, but also ready to cover uh, most questions I think that you'll have. So please use the chat feature and I'll monitor that. I know he will, and I'll try to jump in without interrupting the flow. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to James. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Ann, and good morning, everybody. And um, I'm happy to be here today and good to go over 1031 exchanges. So before I get started, if there's anybody out there that has any specific questions on the 1031 exchange to make sure that I cover it within the course today, just chat it to Randy and um, I, may, I may see it as well, but I wanna make sure that I cover everything. We've got a lot of stuff to go over today and I wanna get over as much as possible and no better way than starting at the beginning. Um, before that, um, I did want to say that, you know, th this shelter in place really impacted me significantly because um, I usually get a haircut every three weeks and I was on like <laughs> week nine. And uh, finally I broke down and had my wife do it. And um, luckily you guys did not see last week for the one mark where I got impatient and say, this is how you do it. And there was a big line right over here. So, um, in desperation mode, do not ever rush your significant other. I've learned that that does not work. And with that, let's get into it. Uh, here are a couple of websites that uh, I think you might want to jot down or since you'll be getting the uh, PowerPoint PDF, these are two websites that you can use as reference materials. Number one is the um, IRS homepage that you can get a lot of the different things regarding tax forms and publications, as well as the latest and greatest on disaster relief. And um, when anything is released, it usually goes on that website first, and then we come out with the publication afterwards. So that's a good one to have. Uh, immediately below that would be our website. Keep this, bookmark it. It's a great reference guide where you have all kinds of PDFs, on pretty much everything regarding the 1031 exchange. And if you need something even more intricate, just feel free to contact me directly. And with that, Internal Revenue Code 1031. You know, it was funny when I was talking to Randy uh, two days ago, Randy and Ann, uh, they asked me how I got into 1031 exchanges. And at the time I was working at Merrill Lynch, like, like Randy said, and I got a call from one of my friends saying, hey, what are you doing? And uh, my answer was hating life because I was cold calling um, and it was just really different in uh, 1997. Um, and it was very difficult. And she said, why don't you come over here? There's an open here, I think you'd be great for it. And the guy I interviewed with who became my boss said, do you know what a 1031 exchange is? And I said, I have no clue. And he said, great, you're hired. He liked where I went to school. He liked uh, my friend and he said, this is perfect because I can teach you from the bottom up on what a 1031 exchange is. And um, I learned that day exactly what a 1031 exchange is. And it actually has um, redefined in my eyes because when I first read something like this, no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property health or productive use in a trade or business, that meant nothing to me. But what I came to understand that when I look at Internal Revenue Code 1031, it's really simple. It's where you are selling and buying investment property. And if you follow certain guidelines, you'll be in a position to pay absolutely zero in capital gains tax. So the real easy definition of 1031 exchange is sale and purchase of investment property you do it right, you pay no capital gains tax. Now, and even on here on this slide, it says the gain is not realized, realized until an investor cashes out of the investment. We don't even think that way in 1031 land. Our motto is buy till you die or swap till you drop because the step up in base that comes in is so beneficial in real estate. 
just knowing that my parents could buy something for nothing, have it amassed to a great fortune, and then when they pass away that that basis will be stepped up to current value, I could sell that property the next day and have no capital gain consequence is huge when it comes to 1031s. So quite often I get questions where people wanna do a 1031 exchange and they say, you know what, um, I'm gonna sell my primary residence and I wanna do a 1031 exchange or I'm gonna sell my property and I find out it's uh, a primary residence uh, or some other type of property that doesn't quite qualify for a 1031 exchange. And then I get the call saying, I need to do a like-kind exchange. And I'm selling, for example, um, farmland. And I, I don't really wanna buy farmland, but I know it's like-kind, so now I'm gonna go from an almond farm um, and uh, I'm gonna go into grapes, can I make this happen? And at that point I explained to them, I don't like the term like kind, I think it's very confusing. I think when you, when you hear like kind, the easy way to find out exactly what like kind means is to ask yourself three questions. Is it real property? Is it used for a business or investment purpose? And is the property in the United States? If you can say yes to the following three questions, then it qualifies as like-kind property. So if you look at the left-hand column of this particular slide, these are the most common types of real property that qualify for a 1031 exchange, and you can interchange them left and right. Selling a single family rental and buying townhomes or condos that you're gonna rent out, or the duplex, the triplex, the, the four unit building. But you could also buy vacant land, multifamily product, industrial, office, retail, hospitality, senior housing, all of these on the left are the most typical residential and commercial types of real property that qualify for a 1031 exchange. But here are some of the ones on the right that you may not realize do qualify for a 1031 exchange. The one that's very popular are the fractional ownerships, either a TIC or a DST. The TIC means tenancy in common and the DST stands for Delaware Statutory Trust. These are very popular exit strategies in a 1031 exchange. So this is potentially how it could work. I could sell a single family home that I've owned for years and it's appreciated in value and I wanna do a 1031 exchange so I don't pay the capital gains tax and reinvest into a different type of asset, but I'm tired of owning an asset that I have to manage. I actually theoretically in a 1031 exchange could sell this single family rental and buy a fractional interest in a large commercial institutional property where I have absolutely no responsibilities at all. So maybe the tenants, the trash, the toilets, the termites, the taxes, all the terrible T's just no longer worked for me on this property, but I didn't want to sell it and buy another mistake in terms of management. I wanted to get into something more passive. This fractional ownership and a large commercial institutional property basically becomes the coupon clipper that you've looked for. So for me, when it comes to a 1031 exchange, when it comes to like kind requirement, it's just what exit strategy is going to work best for me. I've quite often um, represented people in the cell, sale of cell towers and even knew that they qualify. Billboards, we do a lot of those in Vegas. Windmills makes me think of Livermore right off the bat and whether or not we can get some transactions. We actually have done some solar farms. One of the largest transactions we ever had was in Manhattan. We had a, an owner of a small Italian restaurant in downtown Manhattan and just doing his thing, running the restaurant, gets approached and the, um, tall high-rise condos that are around that particular restaurant, the owners came to the guy and said, look, we'll buy the air rights from you so that you can't build up and obstruct our views. He sold the air rights for $400 million and did a 1031 exchange. So the air where he did not earn a penny got him $400 million and now he invested into an asset that's probably given about a five to 7% cash on cash return set for life. It's amazing things that we don't always or don't know qualify for a 1031 exchange do. Um, I had no idea what a mooring was before I actually got into this career, but uh, mooring is like the little buoy out there that you tie your boat to. It's actually considered real property and qualifies for a 1031 exchange. I don't see it on this list over here, but uh, leasehold interests actually qualify for a 1031 exchange as long as they're 30 years or greater, and that does include options. So when you think like kind, I just wanna make sure everybody understands that uh, 
I think it's confusing to most principals that sell when they sell the property and you say you have to buy like kind property. More often than not, when they sell office, they think they have to buy office. When they sell residential, they think they have to buy residential. It's not the case if it's real property, if it's used for a business or investment purpose. If it's in the United States, it does qualify for a 1031 exchange. Now here are the properties that do not qualify for a 1031 exchange. Flippers, so properties that, held, that are held primarily for sale, like if I went, bought, fixed, and sold, and never operated as investment property, it doesn't qualify as investment property. Or if I bought and developed and had new structures on the land that I bought, and I look to immediately sell that, it looks like inventory and doesn't qualify. What you need to do in a scenario like this is you need to operate it as investment property. So depending upon what product type it is, either uh, lease it out, um, to a renter or to uh, some sort of a tenant. And the time frames on how long you need to rent something in order to qualify for a 1031 exchange, well, there are none. It's actually a gray area. So here's the answer that I give to my clients. A, talk to your tax advisor to determine how long you want to hold this property and operate it as investment property to qualify for a 1031 exchange. But B, here are some of the strategies that our clientele use. Now, the aggressive tax advisor is going to say, Operate it as investment property for at least one year and one day, because by definition, that's a capital long-term investment. Then the less aggressive person is going to say, all right, I want you to cross two tax years. So in the event of an audit, it's going to show up on two tax returns. So as long as you show up on two tax returns, I don't care if you're just starting to rent that out in October and then 15 months later, you sell the assets, do a trade. I just want you to cross two tax years. And then the most conservative approach would be to wait two full years. There is certain revenue procedure that kind of blesses two years, but there is no black and white. And with good reason, sometimes you can do it even in a shorter period of time. Now, personal property with the tax reform that we had at the end of 2017 eliminated personal property transactions and now only real property transactions qualify. So what that really means is some of the transactions that we had as 1031 exchanges were for vintage artwork, were for semi-trucks that were on a depreciation schedule, vintage cars, um, in, in, in a gas station, for example, the equipment. Um, when you cost seg uh, a building, that becomes a personal property as well. Those types of transactions, those are actually, in most scenarios, truly like kind, like a jet would have to be going into a jet or um, a yacht would have to go into a yacht. Um, and, and it was so specific when it came to like kind with personal property for livestock. With, we did some trades on livestock. It had to be the same sex in order to qualify. That's been eliminated completely. That no longer qualifies for 1031 exchange treatment. Uh, we had to fight hard to keep real property. Uh, we unfortunately lost. Um, our casualty was personal property 1031 exchanges. Uh, stock sponsor notes don't qualify. Securities do not qualify. Buying an interest in a partnership does not qualify. We quite often have clients that want to sell an asset and buy into a partnership. You cannot do that. You have to buy actually real property. So you would have to buy a tenant in common interest in the property with the partnership in order to make it work, but it would have to actually be into real property to qualify. The primary residents and second homes do not qualify for a 1031 exchange as well. I think these are kind of tricky. Here are the guidelines. On the second home, once I use a property for personal use more than 14 days out of the year, it's a second home and it actually qualifies for no tax exclusion. So what I would want to do is not use it more than 14 days, rent it for 14 days. And after two years, I could sell that second home and qualify for a 1031 exchange. So it's the 14 day rule or the 10% rule. 10% meaning if I rent it out more than 150 days per year, 10% of 150 days is 15 days. I can use it for personal use up to 15 days. So if you rent it a lot of days, you can possibly use it more than 14 days for personal use. So it's either 10% or 14 days, but second homes don't qualify for a 1031 exchange. The primary residence obviously doesn't qualify for a 1031 exchange because if I've lived in the property two out of the last five years, I qualify for the exclusion. 250 if my gain is tax-free if I'm single, 500 if I'm married. However, especially in the Bay Area, there are a lot of properties that are mixed use. I'm born and raised San Francisco, and I can tell you this, I'd say 
really close to 50% of the properties out there will qualify for a 1031 exchange. If we just look at the Sunset District of San Francisco, I'd say about 85% of the properties there have in-laws. I'd say about over half of them are being rented. In that scenario, you could take advantage of both section codes. You live upstairs, you rent downstairs, you 1031 exchange the bottom portion, you do the section 121, 250, 500 for the top portion. It's beautiful. And this applies to obviously the duplex where you live in one unit or rent out the other or any multifamily product or in the East Bay, we have a lot of casitas, ADUs, or in-laws as well. Or if you live on a vineyard or a farm, it's a mixed use property. So there's a lot of scenarios where the primary residence does qualify for a 1031 exchange, but if it's solely a primary, it doesn't. Uh, foreign property for US property does not qualify or vice versa, meaning if I sell in the US, I have to buy in the US. If I wanna do a foreign transaction, I can do that but it's international for international property. And most of the sovereign territories, the United States do qualify, all of them except for Puerto Rico. I don't know why Puerto Rico doesn't qualify, but it doesn't. So when I first started 1031s, I had that definition in the beginning. That's what I thought it was. And I thought investment property for investment property was the reason why people do 1031 exchanges. But I've learned over the years that Nobody does a 1031 exchange. The reason for doing a 1031 exchange is to not pay the tax. That's not the reason why people do a 1031 exchange. They do a 1031 exchange because for whatever reason, that property no longer makes sense. Now, um, I'll give you an example. I, I, I use this example quite often because it hits close to home. My parents bought property in San Francisco in 1972. They bought a single family home in the Forest Hills area, if you're familiar with it, and a three unit building in Noe Valley. And they bought both properties for about $50,000. Now we both, or all of us know today that those properties are worth millions today. And they think the three unit building property is awesome. It's free and clear. Um, they get about $2,000 per unit. Um, it's, it's a cash cow in their eyes. Um, I quite often have the conversation, and I use any time we can get together, which isn't happening that often right now, as we all know, to remind them that this is a horrible piece of investment property. We own investment property for four different reasons. Number one, cash flow. The cash flow on their property is horrendous. They think they get $6,000 a month, but this property was built in 1908. There's expenses. That $6,000 turns to $4,000. $4,000 annually is $48,000. $48,000 on a property that's worth $3 million, that's not good cash flow. So their cash flow is poor, and because of rent control, it's not going to change. Second reason we own investment property is depreciation. We're allowed to take a write-off. The write-off is 27 and a half years for residential property and 39 years for commercial property. Well, this is a three-unit building. It's residential property. They've owned it for well over 40 years, almost 50 years. There is no more depreciation left on this asset. So no more write-off, horrible cash flow that's stuck. Third reason we own investment property is amortization. The property is free and clear, so we're not buying, we're not paying down the loan to build up equity. No more amortization. And the fourth reason we own investment property is appreciation. Now they killed it here. They did awesome. They did excellent. The problem is at some point the appreciation no longer made sense and the return on investment made sense. Now a little bit more about this property. My dad's blue collar, my mom's white collar. That means my dad still works on this property. My dad is in his late 70s, and since he's been blue collar, he's more like 90, yet he still goes out there and works on the property. This property is a nightmare. It makes no sense. A, dad's working on it, B, cash flow is poor, no more amortization, depreciation gone, and appreciation not getting the return they need. This is why people do 1031 exchanges, to get out of a property like that and maybe go into a passive type of real estate where if my dad tries to work on the property, they'll arrest him. I could triple their income. I could get them a new depreciation schedule when they leverage up in a 1031 exchange. There are so many different reasons that people do a 1031 exchange. My parents, for example, hey, better way of life, good security, supplemental income, no more tenants, trash, toilets, termites, taxes, rent control, all the different things. And they could perhaps even leave the state of California to get a better cash flow return on the property and not have to worry about some of the things that affect us and impact us in California that don't in other states. So 
Um, I want everybody to understand that we do not do a 1031 exchange to avoid the tax. It is a great benefit, but the true reason that we do a 1031 exchange is to get a better piece of investment property. Now, whether that's going to consolidate my real estate portfolio, diversify it, increase cash flow, new depreciation schedule, go into a property in a different area for all kinds of different reasons, even if I wanted to, and I have this happen quite often, sell my investment property, buy my dream home that I'm going to retire in, rent it out initially for as long as my tax advisor recommends, and then move into it, pay no tax, get the home of my dreams, or the second home of my dreams, all through a 1031 exchange. To me, it's always, what's the reason you want to unload the property, and what are you looking to do? I can usually make that magic happen through a 1031 exchange, as long as we follow certain guidelines. So, if I wanted to pay the piper and just cash out, and I had the call yesterday, I have it almost every single day, where somebody says, okay, James, I'm done. I was told to call you, but I'm just going to pay the 15% and get out of Dodge. Well, the reality is, it isn't 15%. Now, we're talking California. So, a couple of things. Number one, 15% is probably the lowest that you're going to pay when it comes to the federal tax. It's either going to be 15 or 20% that you would pay on each dollar of gain. And that's really based on your adjusted gross income. There's certain thresholds that you have to hit as a single person or married couple in order to turn from 15 to 20%. So either you're going to pay 15 or 20 or a blend of the two. Now, the, thing, the same thing occurs when it comes to state tax. You're going to go on a sliding scale from 9.3 to 13.3. And again, it's based on income. And that ranges anywhere from 250 to a million dollars on the adjusted gross income. And it'll change sporadically from 9.3, 10.3, 11.3, 12.3, 13.3. .3, uh, and that would be the worst case scenario. But a lot of our clients that uh, have massive income are going to be paying at the top notch. And if I add top notch together, we're not at 15, we're more like at 33%, but we're not done yet because the Obamacare Act that came out in 2012 also will hit you with an additional 3.8% once you hit certain thresholds. And these thresholds are very low, 200 if you're single, 250 if you're married. And this is adjusted gross income. So this means all income you've received as well as the gain that you're getting on this, on this property if you're going to cash out. So I'd say the average in California that you're paying on a gain is about 30% to every dollar. The average you're paying in Central Contra Costa County is probably closer to 33, 34%. And if you're well, if you're well to do, you're probably closer to 40% per every dollar that you're paying in capital gains tax. And the last one that I didn't mention is the depreciation, the write-off that you've had for however long you've taken advantage of that. They'll add it all up together and 25% of that needs to be recaptured. You factor all of this in, taxes are huge. And most people that say, I'm just gonna bite the bullet, when they find out what that bullet is, they change their minds and do a 1031 exchange. Now in different states, they're not hit as hard, but in California, because that state tax is so high, I'd say the majority of people that are looking to cash out at first change their minds. Now here are a couple of the basic rules. In order to be in a position to pay zero in capital gains tax, you wanna buy of equal or greater value. Most people think it's off the gross sales price. It's really not off the gross sales price. It's the gross sales price minus the non-reoccurring closing costs and that net sales price is your target price. You hit the target price or greater, you're in a position to pay zero in capital gains tax. But in order to do that, you need to reinvest all of the cash and replace all of the debt. So it's real simple. If I'm selling for a million dollars and the property is free and clear, let's say the closing costs are 50 grand, I have 950,000 in my exchange account. I use that money to buy something. I use all of the money. I'm done. I'm not paying taxes. Now, in a scenario where I have debt on the asset, and let's say I have a $300,000 loan on the property, it gets paid off, sell for a million, pay off the $300,000, closing costs fifty grand, six fifty dollars in cash. My target price is nine fifty. dollars Six fifty dollars would be the down payment. Now, however I make up that difference, either a new loan or cash, and it could be a loan of any kind. We don't care if the seller wants to finance, if it's private money, if... Uh, your parents want to give you the money. It doesn't really matter. As long as you can make that happen and by replacing the debt with either new debt or new cash, you're golden and you'll be in a position to pay zero in capital gains tax. That's not to say if you buy of less value that it will kill the exchange. If you do that, it still works. You just pay tax on the difference. So if maybe I don't want as much debt and I'm going to buy something a little bit smaller, it could still work. If my basis is low enough, I'll still get the benefit of deferring a lot of the taxes and maybe paying a little 
bit of tax and maybe no tax at all if I have other losses that will offset that gain. We may have certain scenarios where you could take some boot, as they call it, by not reinvesting all of the proceeds or not replacing all of the debt. And instead of being taxed on it, I'll have a write-off when I file my taxes. So these are the basic rules of getting into a position to pay zero in capital gains tax. And there's all kinds of scenarios that could be run, but the best way is just use all the cash, replace all the debt, and then you're not gonna be paying taxes. So as I mentioned earlier, some people leave the state of California for tax reasons. Well, Jerry Brown got privy to this back in 2012 and they talked about it in 2013. And then at the end of 2013, they came up with the California clawback and they implemented in 2014. Here's what it means. If I sell an asset in the state of California and I do not reinvest in California and I go to a different state, I do need to continuously file informational returns to the franchise tax board each year. If I fail to do so, theoretically, they can't come after me, the state of California, to pay the taxes that I owe. What they're trying to do is make sure that you continuously file these tax returns, informational returns showing that you have not sold the new property so that when you eventually sell, they will get paid. Now, in the past, I've seen a couple of CPAs, or I've heard a couple of CPAs tell me that some of the uh, times the franchise tax board has gone after them, they've had to pay the tax, but I've had most of them say they fine you and have you file the, the uh, informational return messages, just file the informational return. It's really simple. We are lucky that we are one of the clawback states that allows you to invest somewhere else without paying the state that you left. There are actually four states in the East Coast where their clawback says, unless you reinvest in the same state, you have to pay our state tax. But over here, Oregon, Wisconsin, and California have a similar clawback where if you file, if you uh, leave a state that you're selling and go into a different one, you just have to file an informational return. This seems obvious, but I gotta tell you, it doesn't happen all the time. When does the 1031 exchange need to be set up? It has to be set up prior to the close of the transaction. Over here, that's prior to the close of escrow on the East Coast, it's prior to the attorney closing the transaction. Um, I gotta tell you, um, I still get the calls per week, um, not as many since COVID-19 hit, but I'm still getting calls where somebody wants to do a 1031 exchange after the close of escrow. If there's anything you take away from this presentation, is make sure that the property qualifies for an exchange. And if, they, if the seller wants to do an exchange or the buyer in a reverse exchange wants to do the exchange, make sure they understand that the appropriate legal documents have to be in place and the qualified intermediary has to have their documents signed prior to the close of that transaction. Otherwise, they're no longer a 1031 exchanger. They are what we call a taxpayer. And we don't want that. So here are the timelines. Like I said, we need to set up the 1031 exchange prior to the close of escrow. And there's nothing we can do about that if it's not set up and they've already received proceeds. Um, it just can't happen. But let's just say it rolls out like a regular 1031 exchange. Here's how it would happen. List the property for sale. Property gets an offer. Accept the offer. Open up escrow. Then open up 1031 exchange account. What we need in order to open up a 1031 exchange account is a copy of the ratified sales contract and preliminary title report. The reason why we need the contract is because we assign it to the rights of the contract. And in essence, we become the seller so that the seller doesn't get the proceeds at the close. We do. We need the preliminary title report because whatever entity sells needs to do the 1031 exchange. They also need to buy the replacement property. So the preliminary title report in most cases shows the correct vesting and that's how we prepare our exchange paperwork. So at the close of escrow, the proceeds go into the 1031 exchange account and then the clock starts ticking. You have 45 calendar days from the close of escrow to identify potential replacement property. There are really no extensions that you can count on in this transaction. So 45, calendar days from the close of escrow to identify to us in writing potential, pro potential properties that you're going to acquire. From day 45, you have an additional 135 days to close on what you identified within the first 45. 
I don't know where they came up with these time frames. I agree with everybody that says that 45 is unfair and it should be just 180 for everything. But I believe the reason why they have these silly time frames is because the IRS wants you to fail so that you pay taxes. So they make it inconvenient and difficult to achieve without proper planning. So um, no matter what the reason is, those are calendar days and there's no extensions granted on that in most scenarios. Now here are the identification rules that you have to adhere to. The first and the most common one is the three property rule. This allows you to identify up to three properties within the 45 day period of any value. So it could be a billion dollars, it could be $1, it does not matter. There's no limit on the value. The limit is that within the 45 day period, I can only identify three. Now you could change those within the 45 day period as often as you like, but come midnight on day 45, the three that you have identified, those are the only three that you can move forward with on your 1031 exchange. But then I got the client all the time in California that says, look, I'm selling an Alamo for two and a half million dollars. We're doing a 1031 exchange. It was actually one of the investment properties in Alamo. And we don't want to buy one property. We want to go to Buffalo, New York, where they sell condominiums out there for $30,000. And three properties, that's just not going to cut it. That'll get it to the $90,000. It's nowhere close. And then I let them know, well, you're in luck because there's a second rule that's called the 200% rule. And here's how it works. You're selling for $2.5 million. Multiply it by two. That's 200%. That gets you to $5 million, which allows you to, die, uh, uh, which allows you to identify $5 million worth of real estate. Now, that is a lot of $30,000 condos that you could buy with $2.5 million, but you don't have to limit it to condos. You could buy a bunch of different properties. What you can't do is identify more than $5 million worth of real estate, but this does allow you to identify multiple smaller pieces of real property as potential replacement property. You only really want to close on 2.5 or greater. You don't have to close on all five, but that's the maximum. In my opinion, if I'm looking to buy the one big bad boy, it's a three property rule. If I'm looking to diversify and buy a lot of smaller properties, it's the 200% rule. And if I'm a gambler, then I'm going to use the 95% exception. Basically this rule, I've been in this industry for over 20 years and done over 50,000 of these. I've seen this rule work about 12 times. So this is what you have to do in order for it to work. You can identify as many properties as you want, regardless of market value, but you need to close on 95% of the market value that you identify. Basically meaning you need to close on everything or your, fit or your exchange will fail. Most people just don't use this rule. If you're outside of the 45 day period, this is not a rule that is used very often. Now, I mentioned earlier that there really aren't extensions, but there are two instances where there can be an extension. Number one is military deployment, and number two is a natural disaster or an act of terrorism. Now, here is the history of disaster exemptions, extensions on 1031 exchanges. We had some extensions prior to 2005, but we didn't actually have a revenue procedure until May of 2005. And luckily enough, a few months later, Hurricane Katrina hit, and what happens is the disaster relief goes on the government website that I mentioned earlier. The IRS comes out with the ruling, the president signs off on it, and it goes out and it references a revenue procedure. And the revenue procedure has certain guidelines that need to be met because of the disaster. Now, this disaster relief and these revenue procedures have been changed. And the latest and greatest is RevProc 2018-58, which granted an additional 120 days on your 45 and 180 day period. So it was beautiful for somebody who got impacted and the way you had to be impacted was it had to either impact your primary residence, the property that you were selling, your place of business, or maybe the qualified intermediary that was operating your transaction or somebody that was in the midst of your transaction. The reason why I bring this up and I think that it's so relevant is well, we got hit with something unforeseen um, out of nowhere and um, we didn't get an extension at first. We, uh, we had a lobby for it. And when COVID-19 hit, we had a lot of people calling us up and saying, I can't get into properties. I can't get inspections. Funding is, is impossible. What is going to happen? When are we going to get some relief? And we had to keep on telling them it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And it didn't come. So we banded together as a coalition with over 21 real estate corporations over 3 million um, members and we wrote the IRS directly saying, where's the extension? We need this, it's timely in a 1031 exchange. 
And um, finally, a few weeks after that, we received uh, the disaster notice 2020-23, which provided an automatic extension on the 45-day identification period and 180-day time frame, as long as either one of those deadlines fell between April 1st and January 14th, you were automatically extended to July 15th. So this was huge for a lot of our clients that they did receive the disaster relief. It was not what we anticipated. However, it did not reference the revenue procedure. It did not provide an automatic 120 days. And more importantly, it didn't protect all of the taxpayers because anybody who had a 45th day or 180th day that was prior to April 1st, maybe anywhere, you know, after the beginning of March, they clearly were impacted and they did not receive any disaster relief. Here's where we stand right now. We're in talks with the IRS, but uh, unfortunately there has been no other uh, clarity or extension on the current extension. And this may be all that we get. This also impacted the opportunity zone. So this was a guideline that was thrown out there for a lot of different uh, tax deadlines for us. 2020-23 means if you're 45 or your 180-day lands after April 1st and before July 15th, you're automatically extended out to July 15th. So you still have an opportunity to take advantage of it if you're closing right now. You still may have an opportunity to take advantage of it if your deadline fell within those time frames. But pretty soon, pretty soon those are going to expire. And with shelter in place kind of being relieved somewhat. We're not sure if there are going to be additional extensions that are granted. Okay, um, reverse exchanges. These are very popular for the client that has the ideal property, whether it be the office building that they want to acquire, or whether it's the primary residence that they eventually want to move into, or whether it's a property that they were in contract with while they were in contract with the property that they were selling, and the property that they were selling fell out of contract. So basically the reverse exchange is where you buy first and sell second. So let's just say that I am doing a reverse exchange. I am selling um, a single family home rental and I am looking to buy a six unit building. And I wanna buy the six unit building in Oakland. And there is no inventory for that currently. And I know that 45 days is not enough time for me to find something and selling my property will be very easy. Here's what I could do. I could go into contract to buy that six unit building, but I can't go on title as James. So I have to get the qualified intermediary in the mix. And the way it would work is the qualified intermediary would set up an LLC, a special purpose entity. We call it an EAT, an exchange accommodator title holder, which is the single member LLC that will go on title at the close of escrow for title purposes alone. I will operate and have the benefits and burden and responsibility of the property. And from the close of escrow on that six unit building, I will have 180 days to sell my single family residence. This probably will not be an issue because the property that I'm selling is in an area that is very coveted, but I will be able to secure my property and not have to worry about the 45 day period. Now, most people think, well, why doesn't everybody just buy first and sell second? And here is the problem with buying first and selling second. It's more challenging. Most people depend on the money come from the sale in order to finance the purchase of the acquisition property. So uh, a lot of people just can't do it. Um, number two, it is more challenging unless you have cash. If you have cash, it is very easy to do a reverse exchange. It's a little more costly, but not too much more costly. Um, you come in with the cash, purchase the property, it goes into the name of the LLC, 180 days to sell your property, no problem. If you have to get financing, most lenders are not okay with the LLC going on title or they're not okay with our non-recourse language. So perhaps in certain scenarios, you have to get private money or some other means and the origination fees for something like this, that's when the fees start to climb up in value. And then the LLC goes on title and eventually I may want to assume title. So there could be dual transfer tax as well. I think the reverse exchange is a fantastic, phenomenal vehicle for the client that definitely can make it happen and definitely needs to make it happen because of the lack of inventory or just that deal that they can't pass up on. But reverse exchanges are very popular and we are seeing them. They also were impacted by the extension. They did have uh, additional time um, in their transaction to complete it as well. So uh, reverse exchanges are very popular. 
as well as the improvement exchange. Now, I quite often get questions where someone wants to do a 1031 exchange and they say, James, okay, I'm selling this property over here and the property I wanna buy, well, it needs work. Can I use some of those monies, the proceeds that come from the sale in order to improve the asset that I'm going to acquire? And the answer is yes, but it's a different type of exchange. Now, improvements are not deemed real property, so improvements do not qualify. We can't just have all the money go over and then you start paying for improvements. So the way it works is similar to a reverse exchange. You sell your asset, but on the replacement property, the accommodator will set up another single member LLC that will go on title. While we are on title, the money can be filtered through the accommodator to the contractor and have the improvements done. Now, most people say, that's great. That's exactly what I wanna do. Here is the uh, hurdle with build a suit exchanges. You have to complete the improvements within the 180 day time frame, And this is one of the bigger challenges on the improvement exchange. It's very difficult to get a property built from A to Z or certain improvements when uh, permits and other different um, items need to be in place in order to get the improvements completed. And I've had a lot of clients ask me, well, what about if I give the contractor all the money and the improvements aren't completed and we close on that transaction? Um, number one, if somebody's taking pictures and they report you, um, you're probably in trouble. It's a 10% finder's fee and it's anonymous and they probably made some cash. But more importantly, I don't think I would trust any contractor with a load of money on improvements that were not completed. They could just theoretically run off. So um, that question does come up a lot and some people like to go in that fashion, but I'm the kind of person that wants to stick within the rules and sticking within the rules would make those improvements. A, be identified what you're going to do the property in the 45 day period and B, have them completed within the 180 day period. Remember, you do not have to complete the entire project. You just wanna get it to the equal or greater number so if I sold for a million and I'm buying something for 800,000 that needs $400,000 of work, I just need to complete $200,000 of work. I just need to identify that and get that done within the 180 day time frame. So they are not as popular because they're more difficult to achieve, but I certainly do have people looking to do build the suits every week. Now, I think it's really important. I kind of mentioned this briefly uh, in the beginning uh, or towards the beginning part of the presentation on when we set up a 1031 exchange, we need the preliminary title report and the sales contract. Uh, the, re the reason why we need the preliminary title report is because the entity that sells needs to be the entity that buys. Now this can be quite confusing in scenarios because I could be single when I buy a property and then I get married. I never put my wife on title and I look to buy the replacement property with my wife. If I'm selling for a million and we're buying for a million and James is doing the exchange, but James and Angie are buying the property, it really looks like I'm only buying $500,000 in this transaction and the other portion could be considered boot. So there are some ways to fix it. In my scenario, we've been married forever. I bought it before I was married. We've been filing jointly forever. I'll quick claim her on title to reflect current tax reporting on the property that I'm selling. James and Angie sell, James and Angie buy. In scenarios that is not the case, then I would recommend that that sole taxpayer do the trade. And then later on, after it, that their taxpayer recommends, add the spouse to title. Now, that is a, a common one that happens with residential property. Um, one that happens more with commercial transactions uh, are the partnerships. The, the partnership sells and um, there's multiple members within that partnership and only some want to do exchanges and the others want to cash out or um, they all want to do exchanges, but they don't want to do exchanges together. This is probably the number one hurdle when it comes to commercial transactions. Um, the entity that sells being the entity that buys the largest transaction um, I ever had at IPX. And, and I got to tell you, I, I, got the, I got the contract and I was floored. It was for uh, $800 million, a huge project in, in Southern California, uh, and these brothers had owned it for decades, like 30, 40 years, tremendous gain on the property. Um, and we had a conference call and I spoke um, 
with the, the attorney and he said, okay, we're going to get about three more attorneys and three more tax advisors on the call. We're going to have this on Friday. Uh, there's three brothers that own this property in the LLC. Right off the bat, that had me worried. We had the conference call and I find out that they're looking to sell. They're looking to 1031 exchange and they're all looking to go their separate ways. And I told them that this looks like it could be an issue because the LLC is the entity that owns and operates the property for tax purposes but each brother is looking to buy in their own name and other assets in a 1031 exchange. And in the event of an audit, they could invalidate the transaction. And as a matter of fact, in 2009, they revised the 1065 partnership return form and they added line item 12 and 13. Did you dissolve your partnership within the last year? Are you doing a 1031 exchange? And the reason I brought that up is because their strategy was to drop out of the LLC, hold it as tenants in common. So each brother would have their tenant in common, 33.3% interest in the property, and they would go their separate separate ways and buy as brother A, brother B, and brother C. Now, the problem with this, in my opinion, was that you're dissolving this about a month or two before the close of escrow. You've never operated as this new entity, and now you're looking to do a 1031 exchange. And in particular, in the state of California, they are going after this and you're dropping and swapping and this is very risky. And they decided to not do the transaction. And, um, and I quite often ask people, do you know who the biggest loser was in this transaction? It wasn't me, my fee isn't that much. And it's definitely not all the attorneys on the call because there's billable hours, hours or the tax advisor. But the commercial broker was about to get one and a half percent on $800 million. I told them, I go, this is what I would do. I would talk to the brothers and I would say, dissolve the partnership, operate it as tenants in common, do that for one to two years, then do the 1031 exchange. And you'll, I'll wait a year or two for a transaction like that. But what I've learned um, throughout my career is that when hatred is that deep, it is very difficult to get anybody to agree. And to this day, still own the asset, still in the LLC, nothing has happened. So that brings me to, the next slide, partnership issues. And um, I think this one is relevant because there's been some recent changes within uh, the code uh, regarding partnerships. Number one, when tax reform came, there was a change that impacted uh, 1031 exchanges. Number one, uh, in the past, when there was, for example, three members in a partnership, if one wanted to cash out, and they all owned 33% in that partnership, we could easily tenant in common the one out, keep the partnership together. And as long as the majority of the partnership wanted to move forward with the trade, we could make that work. What we didn't like is that it had to be majority. So if two wanted to cash out and wanted to, one wanted to move forward, or if one owned 60% and the other two only owned 40% combined, you couldn't use the strategy. Well, in, in, in the midst of tax reform, they changed that qualification. Now, no longer does the majority of the partnership have to move forward to qualify for um, a 1031 exchange or be safe in the event of an audit within a 1031 exchange. Now, as long as the partnership moves forward, you can do that with any percentage. So theoretically, in that example, if one owner owned 60% and the other two owned 40% together, then the 60% owner could just cash out, tenant in common them out of the partnership, and the other two could remain in the partnership and move forward, all set, no longer has to be majority. And let's take it to the next extreme. Let's say um, two of them wanted to cash out and there's only one left, only owning 20%. That person could move forward with the, ch with the exchange. Now, a partnership still does have to have more than one member. So if that person was married, I would recommend getting their spouse involved um, to keep that partnership alive. If not, they're going to have to have somebody come in with them to keep the partnership alive and they will have to buy 1% from one of the two um, exiting members of the partnership. That was one big change that occurred in 2018. But I think I have something even better. Um, recently, um, and there's a couple of different ways right here before we get to that to resolve partnership issues. Drop and swap is, is the most popular one that we've seen and the most aggressive. So to me, it's more drop season than swap. 
Uh, you can purchase the interest of the retiring partner. Um, you can have an installment notes um, when you sell the relinquished property. Uh, that works also in, in a partnership. Um, the partnership division um, is kind of, all, all of these are um, strategies that just really aren't that popular. Um, they just are difficult to work. Um, the best strategy always, in my opinion, was we know we're going to sell it in the future. We know we all want to do a 1031 exchange, consult our tax advisor. And at that point, usually they dissolve the partnership and operate it as the new entity for at least one to two years before they sell the asset and then um, safely, safely do a 1031 exchange. But we had something kind of interesting. We had the Mitchell case. And this is the case of a drop and swap where the taxpayer actually won. And um, it was two days prior to the um, closing that they dropped out of the LLC and Sharon Mitchell had a 10% interest in the partnership and moved forward with the 1031 exchange, got audited, passed the audit, and the franchise tax board did not like this and uh, petitioned for a rehearing, asked for the uh, appeal this, and the Office of Tax Appeals denied the request, saying that there wasn't sufficient evidence to justify um, that this was a, a written against uh, current law. And um, I have copies attached on the webinar. I think this one's kind of groundbreaking for the clients that own property in a partnership that have... Um, decided to unload the asset in 1031 exchange and go in their separate direction. We haven't had something like this. Um, there's good and bad to this though. In the past, we would tell people, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Some would still do it. Um, now we say, get your attorney involved, get your attorney involved and get your attorney involved. Um, and and here, are, here are the reasons why. Um, it, the OTA denied the Franchise Tax Board request for the rehearing. Um, they held that the grounds needed for the rehearing denied the, the request. But most importantly, this case is not precedental. Um, so you can't really use this. It's not as strong as an argument if you were to get audited and reference the Mitchell results. So um, it, it can't really re be relied upon as an authority in, in, in the event of an audit or in litigation. Um, I, I do think it gives you a lot more meat than before. I do think it helps, but we've been in talks, the exchange um, industry has an annual meeting, the Federation of Exchange Accommodators puts it on, and we, our legal counsel actually sat next right next to somebody who heads up the franchise tax board in Sacramento and said, uh, we're not happy about this and we are going to continue to challenge and we're not changing our, our position on drop and swaps. So um, I think there's more meat. I think there, um, is a, there are a lot more taxpayers there that are going to, to drop and swap now more than ever. But um, I, I still do think that the taxpayers need to be prepared to litigate in the event of something going wrong. Um, this decision only relates to, to California's state tax, um, not federal or any other state. So um, that's kind of good because we're in California. Um, I, I think um, we just can't rely on this as the biggest impact, but I think you could use this as a structure in your arguments against any decisions that come against in the midst of a drop and swap. I think this is huge for the client that wants to move forward and that is a bit aggressive. They actually have something to cling on to and I have some clients that move forward, but um, I have had some that have also gone to their counsel and say, we're not doing this. So this is more of the call of the tax advisor for the client that is looking to sell an asset. Um, finally today, I wanted to go over um, 1031 exchanges and um, opportunity zones, because I get this question quite often. Can the 1031 exchange be combined with an opportunity zone? Can you 1031 exchange into an opportunity zone? 
Um, first off, you can't 1031 exchange into an opportunity zone. It's a fund and you have to go into real property. Um, so uh, setting up a qualified opportunity fund and, and, and doing that in a 1031 exchange does not work. But can it be combined with an opportunity zone? And, and the answer is it may be. And that depends on your 1031 exchange and what's going on with your 1031 exchange. So there's a few ways that it could work in conjunction. Um, if you start a 1031 exchange prior to the close of escrow, set up the 1031 exchange, and they have the 45 day identification period to find potential replacement property, they could continue with the 1031 exchange, but if they decide that they don't find anything within that 45 days, they could instead of taking the money and paying the taxes, they could invest into an opportunity zone fund so as a backup to a 1031 exchange, it could be worked in that scenario. It, it also could work in the scenario where perhaps you've identified something within the 45 day period, but it's not gonna close in the 180 day, 180 day period. A, the, the seller took it off the market. Um, B, somebody else bought it. C, uh, after going through the inspections, it just isn't gonna fly for you. In that scenario, since Opportunity Zones somewhat mirror 1031 exchanges in timeframes, you have 180 days to close on um, a 1031 exchange and 180 days to get into an Opportunity Fund, you could front the cash out of your own pocket. And remember, in an Opportunity Zone, you're only putting in the gain, not the um, equal or greater amount of the net sales price on a 1031 exchange. So theoretically, if the money was stuck there till day 180, and sometimes the money is stuck in a 1031 exchange. The money can't be released if you identify something in your past day 45 until you either you close or day 181. So if it's in that scenario, you could theoretically front the gain money into an opportunity zone and still take advantage. So there's a couple of different um, ways that that could be made. And even in an opportunity zone, if you own it in a partnership, you may get more than 180 days. So even after day 180, um, you may have the opportunity to still go into an opportunity zone, depending upon how the property that was sold, um, how, what entity um, owned and operated that property. So the two ways to combine it with uh, 1031 and opportunity zones is you set up the 1031 exchange. And if you don't ident identify anything within 45 days, you can send the money, um, just the gain money into uh, an opportunity zone fund. Or if um, within the 180 day time frame, you can front the money into an opportunity zone fund, or if uh, it's in a partnership that provides you a longer than a 180 day period, perhaps that money could go into the OZ fund after day 180. So it really depends. There's a couple of ways it could be combined. Now, here's a comparison matrix really quickly on um, 1031 and opportunity zones, just to get rid of any misconceptions. Um, tax deferral on 1031 exchange to us, yes, and that's buy till you die. So you may, it may not just be deferred, it may just be gone forever. That's the, that's what our true investors or most of our investors like to do is just continuously buy and get better investment properties and never pay the tax. In an opportunity zone fund, um, you do have to pay the tax that is owed. Number one, California has not adopted it, so you'll pay that up front. And number two, um, you'll pay uh, the rest of it with a 10% discount um, nowadays um, at no later than 1231.26. Um, and um, the investment requirement is, um, like I mentioned earlier, on the 1031 exchange, the net sales price on the opportunity zone, it's just the capital gain. Um, and the minimum hold period for uh, a 1031 exchange. Um, there is no actual time frame, but um, after this class, you pretty much can determine that one to two years is the norm. Um, and if there's a good reason, perhaps even less than that for opportunity zone to receive a reduction on the taxes, uh, it's going to have to be till that uh, 1231 26. So anywhere between five to six years. Um, with where we are right now. And to really take advantage, you're gonna have to own it for 10 years. So um, there is a, a large hold period on that. Um, the opportunity zone um, is a security. Uh, it's not real estate. Um, and that's why it doesn't work as replacement property in a 1031 exchange. In a 1031 exchange, there's an obvious secondary market for this um, in an opportunity zone fund. Um, we'll find out, right? When this comes to um, 10 years from when the first one happened, 
um, eligibility to invest in a 1031 exchange. Anybody can do it. Opportunity zone funds are usually accredited investors. Um, the accredited investor, uh, you have to make over um, 200 for the past two years or 300 of joint income or have a net worth of $1 million, excluding your primary residence. Um, and um, with an entity that's $5 million of assets, so if it's a corporation or LLC, you have to have $5 million worth of assets in order to qualify. So there's different things on an opportunity zone and a 1031 exchange, but in some scenarios, it can be uh, combined. Now, and finally, the last thing I did want to mention today that I think is very important that we understand Anybody can be a qualified intermediary for the most part. The only people that can't be a qualified intermediary are related parties or an agent of the party, meaning if your tax advisor, real estate professional has been employed by you within the last two years, they cannot be your qualified intermediary, but everybody else, including this guy, could actually put together documents, hold your proceeds, and guide you through the 1031 process. Now, I would highly recommend that you are very careful when selecting a qualified intermediary. There are some industry nightmares that happen over the years. Um, on this slide, there's, there's a few here. The one that I like to use as an example is the 1031 tax group. They um, were featured on American Greed. The guy took the money, invested into different things, uh, lost some of the money, wasn't careful with the money, took some of the money, left the country, came back um, and got caught. Uh, I guess the moral lesson for him is don't come back and um, currently serving um, 100 years in prison. Um, but I think the moral to the story is uh, be very careful in selecting a qualified intermediary because it's in, you know, unregulated industry where we can pretty much do what we want with the proceeds and um, selecting the wrong qualified intermediary could put your client's money at risk. Um, and we've seen where they lost the money and still had to pay taxes. Here's what you need to look for in a qualified intermediary. Um, you wanna look and see who the parent company is. You wanna look and see if they have a current fidelity bond, errors in emission, where is the money being held? Is it safe? Are they gonna to continue to be around? Um, really quickly, we're the largest qualified intermediary in the business. We're owned by Fidelity National Financial. They provide a third party guarantee of performance of up to 50 million per file. We only bank with banks that are larger than us that have over 10 billion in assets. I mean, there's a lot of different things, um, but I think those are the questions that you need to ask. I, I, would not, um, I would not use a smaller company. I would use a larger one and I would wanna know um, their financial strength and where they place the funds as everything in segre segregated accounts. Um, no matter how much they know, if the money isn't safe, there isn't, there isn't um, a 1031 exchange to be had. I think what's also really important is that um, with the extensions that came out for COVID-19, if your exchange company didn't have language that referenced it, you don't get the extensions. So again, be very careful in selecting a qualified intermediary. You wanna make sure that they have everything that you need for every case scenario. They have the strength, the security, and the expertise that can guide you through the process because there are a lot of different things out there that can happen in a 1031 exchange. And all it takes is one mistake to ruin it for the taxpayer. Uh, we also provide an additional measure of security. And a lot of people were taking this with COVID-19, qualified trust accounts that protect in the event of a bankruptcy. And um, the reason why I mentioned that is because on that other slide, there were a few companies that filed for bankruptcy and a qualified trust account would protect the taxpayer in the event of that bankruptcy. So um, one last question to think about, what did they successfully prosecute Al Capone for? The motto of the criminal in investigation division of the IRS is, if the FBI can't catch you, the accountants with guns will. And that's exactly what happened to Mr. Capone. So at, that, at this point, um, I'd like to conclude the presentation. Here's all of my contact information. Um, if there's any questions that anyone has, I left a bunch of stuff off of the presentation today because I know that we didn't have that much time and we're already been here for over 65 minutes. Um, Randy, you wanna chime in now? Is there anything on the chat? I haven't really been paying attention or is there anybody out there with any questions on anything that I've mentioned or anything that I haven't mentioned? Let's see, I don't see any questions, um, but maybe we'll give them just a second. It is really odd to do this not in person. 
did not get any reaction on anything. This is the first time I've seen a live human in 65 minutes. So thank you, Randy, for coming to the screen. Yeah, no, it's, it's impressive. Uh, it's it's got to be far more difficult than Scott's. Yeah, it is. And I get breakfast there. Um, is there somebody on the chat right now? A compliment of a good overview on 1031s. I, th I think we're, I think we're good then, unless somebody else has something. I think uh, Anne is going to be sending out all of the information, um, the, including the PowerPoint presentation. And I told her I would also send the documents regarding the Mitchell case that if you have a client that is looking to perhaps uh, deal with the partnership issues, they could review that information and use that as a guideline in the event they want to proceed. And Anne, you're usually pretty quick about getting that material out because there's a question about how soon. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Marie, it'll be Monday at the latest. Um, the best way to contact me would be to call my cell phone number. Um, I think it, it, it's all over, it's all of this stuff that Anne is going to be sending. Um, but if there is a particular subject matter that I spoke about today and it's not covered in the materials that Ann provides, then I have PDFs on pretty much everything, whether it's um, partnerships or um, seller financing that I did not mention, build a suit or reverse exchanges. Um, I had to go through everything rather quickly and not provide that much in terms of examples, just because there's a lot of stuff that's going on with 1031s right now. And then uh, happy Friday, everybody. Yeah. Every, even though every day seems like a Friday now. Yeah. Wait, is it Friday? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's Friday. Yeah, I know. See, that's how I get every day. My wife's like, what day is it again? It's just our routines are different, but we're still here out yeah. there helping. Yeah. By the way, if anybody wants an update on the 1031 exchange market, we have not slowed down as much as I thought we would um, to let you know. Uh, what has slowed down, unfortunately, has been commercial product. We've seen uh, office, retail, and hospitality come to a standstill in most scenarios, and a lot of things fall out of contract. But on the residential side of the coin, multifamily product um, and some uh, tenant-anchored grocery-type model transactions, those are still moving. Um, and our business has only dropped about 30%, and we thought we were going to take a larger hit than that. So they're still happening, and we're happy to help. All right. Oh, there's a question here. Are you familiar with the new rent control laws and how that might impact selection of replacement property? Um, I don't know the, the exact, um, I, I know it's throughout the state of California and how it's going to impact. Um, we've had on the replacement property side, well, on the relinquished property side, we've had a lot of people unload properties because of rent control, looking to get into assets that are not subject to rent control. So they leave the state of California. Uh, we have not seen an impact selection of replacement property in terms of rent control, um, like we thought that it would. Multifamily product is still moving significantly, um, but I'm not as familiar with the new rent control laws to see how it impacted um, all the investment properties. Um, and yeah, there are exceptions for the single family residents. And, um, and, I, and I, I do believe that that proposal, that wicked proposal that they were coming up for multifamily product has not happened either. The reduction of rent for of 25% for a year because of COVID-19. Um, and we're avidly fighting against that, but that, that could be on the ticket next month again. Um, Marie, so you're saying there are exception, except, exceptions for single family residents, but it's been dropped? I'm reading the chat in case anybody is curious. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I will find right. out um, any information I can about that. Um, so Senate Bill 828 has been dropped. Okay. So uh, I guess the exceptions for single family residents. Yeah the 25% rent reduction. And I heard um, that it could be brought back up again, but I hope that doesn't happen. 
Okay, hopefully. So we agree. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> On that note, um, unless anybody else wants to chime in with anything else, um, stay safe, stay healthy. I'd love to see you guys in person. Um, that would have been more fun at Scott's. Um, this is still weird, but good. And we can still continue to work remotely. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Randy. Another great program. Thanks right. a lot. Everybody have a great weekend. Take care. Take bye -bye. care. Okay, bye-bye.